This is Mark Lieberman, the host of the podcast, The World According to Mark. And today we have the pleasure of interviewing and having a talk with Robert Arley White, who goes by the name of Bob, to those who know him. Um, and now I get to know him, so I get to call him Bob. So let me first introduce Bob and say thank you very much for agreeing to uh, share your thoughts about theater um, with our audience. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thank you for thinking of me. So, um, and I'm forced to think about you every week because <laughs> uh, I have to con confess that I am in the cast of the wonderful production of Our Town, which is a play long regarded as one of the most important plays in American theatrical uh, areas. And Bob is uh, directing that play. But Bob is um, importantly also the artistic director for the Asheville Community Theater here in Asheville, North Carolina. But he has a long and I'll say storied career with um, another theater and has will have more to tell us about that. So let me jump into it and let Bob tell us a little bit about how he got here to Asheville. Um, what he did before he got to Asheville. And, um, and we'll talk about things that I think are important to know about community theater in 2022 in, in the United States. So Bob, you, I think if I have this right, you were born in Bethesda, Maryland. Wow, you did some research, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and, but you, before coming directly to uh, Asheville, you were coming directly from Jacksonville, Florida. Right. So tell us um, what that uh, voyage was about. <laughs> and and your, your word voyage is well chosen. My dad had a really brilliant career in the Navy, and that allowed us to live all over the place. And additionally, uh, my dad uh, distinguished himself such that he was able to be the administrative aide to Admiral Arleigh Burke at the time when he was the commander in chief of the United States Naval Forces. So that's where my middle name comes from, is uh, from him. He's a bona fide World War II hero and uh, certainly a hero to our country and something that I'm very proud of. Um, I was born in Bethesda, but we were actually living in Northern Virginia at the time. And from there we moved to Naples, Italy, which is uh, where I learned to, to speak. Uh, both of my parents were working and, and I stayed during the day with an Italian couple and, and I'm told that that was my first language, um, although I don't remember any of it. And then uh, from there we moved back to the Washington DC area and from there to Lenore, North Carolina, where uh, my mother's mother and sister lived. Uh, my dad was deployed on a ship. Uh, he came back and we moved again to the Washington DC area. And then from there, we moved to Oslo, Norway, where I lived between the time when I, were, I was eight and 12. From there to Winter Park, Florida, from there to Washington DC, from there to Honolulu, uh, where I went to most of my high school. And then at the beginning of my senior year of high school, my dad was transferred to uh, Mayport, Florida, which is a small naval station just outside of Jacksonville. And, um, and because we were moving from uh, Honolulu to Mayport, I was bitter. Um, and I look back on all that, but it, it turns out that Jacksonville in many, many ways was just exactly perfect for me. But as I said, my mother's people are from the mountains of Western North Carolina. They're actually scattered between Asheville and Blowing Rock. And uh, uh, we spent a lot of time, a lot of summers growing up here. And then as an adult, I found myself drawn to the area uh, often, um, I would say that over the course of the last 20 or 25 years, I found myself in the Asheville area at least once a quarter or so. So I feel like I know my way around a little bit. I have a lot of family here. I have a lot of really good friends here. Many people from Jacksonville, as you would imagine, have relocated from there to here. So in moving from Jacksonville to Asheville just this past April, there is a real sense of homecoming attached to that. Um, I really feel um, that this is where I belong. Um, it has been a green lights all the way kind of experience for me and uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm thrilled to be here as a matter of fact. 
Uh, but I do want to tell you one quick side story. Um, in Honolulu, when I was probably 13 or 14 years old, my very best friend said to me, hey, they're having auditions after school today. We should go do that. And in that moment, you know, he handed my life to me. And that fella, for other reasons altogether, ended up with his family in Jacksonville as well. And so um, um, I think that's one of the small miracles in, in life, or certainly in my life, that uh, somebody who's known me since I was a whippersnapper um, is still in touch with me today. He still lives with his family in Jacksonville. And it's a, it's a very, very rich context for me. And who gave you your first, first push into the theater business <laughs> right. of, of a sort. Okay. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember what you auditioned for and did you get the part? Um, it was a very small show. And um, it was a it was a holiday type of show, and um, actually uh, he got the part and I got a stand-in part. <laughs> and what did that do to your what did that do to your relationship with him? <laughs> you were still good friends. He was, he was a really great guy, and I learned so much from him. And and, uh, and looking back over the years, he's one of those few people to whom I've always been close, and you know we've never had any real squabbles or anything like that. So. Uh, uh, it, it was a good thing. It was a very good thing and, and continues to be so. So from that beginning, at least an in introduction to theater in a small <laughs> but meaningful way, um, right. what did you do to further your interest and involvement in theater? Did you, uh, I don't know for sure, but uh, I, know, I know you uh, studied <laughs> both English and theater at uh, Oklahoma Baptist University. Exactly uh, right. Um, I went to Baptist about that. thinking that I was going to be a preacher and discovered rather quickly that that was really not in the cards for me. Um, but uh, I don't know if you remember um, Jim J. Bullock. He played Monroe on Too Close for Comfort. He was the center square of the Hollywood squares whenever uh, Whoopi Goldberg had that franchise. And I think later on, he actually had a talk show with Tammy Faye Baker. Anyway, he was uh, my roommate at Oklahoma Baptist University. And um, and he was he, he, he was a super fun guy. But my point is that uh, it had a, a pretty strong theater program. And I got very, very involved there. Um, since uh, I graduated from OBU, I, I immediately became a teacher and I did a number of other things, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but I've always understood my work to be in the realm of uh, uh, what I would like to have done as a preacher, which is to say uh, community building work. Um, and it does occur to me that the arts and maybe theater uh, more than any of the other disciplines is a place where everybody gets to go. You know, even when you think about um, um, religion or philosophy or, or whatever, there, there are these barriers that say, I go, you can't, I belong, you don't. And I find that those barriers dissipate and disappear um, in the arts. It's a place where we really all do come together. Um, I discovered quickly as I was running little theaters and, and doing that kind of work in Florida that the, uh, the work in many ways is analogous. We're telling stories, we're building empathy, we're building community. Um, and, and so I think, you know, in my own way, without, um, without having to be, you know, particularly religious in one way or another, I'm able to do work that is really, really important to me, which involves bringing a, a diverse group of people together to pursue a singular artistic vision. And it is thrilling, thrilling work for me. And I, I guess I would volunteer, but really want your opinion on it. There is obviously a performance aspect of, of religion and particularly um, with uh, the, the rise of uh, television uh, broadcasts of religious services and uh, people that take to the airways. And of course that was done even before television was popular, it was done on the radio. So there's a, there's a performance element, um, but I'm not sure if that was very instrumental in terms of your moving sort of between those two worlds, theater and, and the church. That's 
that's so really that's very interesting. I mean, it, it, it's obvious, but it's not something I've given a lot of attention to because um, I thought of you know the the uh, religious work as work that is more about caring uh, for people in its very very best sense, and then of course um, there's in in the performance piece of it. I think you're looking for ways to share something honestly, authentically, in a transparent way that people can relate to. I guess, I guess there's a connection there, but they, one feels very, very sort of um, internal, and the other feels very external. But I guess they're, I guess, I guess it's all about creating a kind of empathy where everybody can go and feel welcomed, celebrated, comfortable, uh, easy, accessible. Well, let me touch on this. I was going to get to this a little later, but I think we're in the okay. vicinity of what one of the things I wanted you to talk about. And that is we're talking about theater um, and we're talking about, but we're talking about what is generically referred to in many cases as community theater. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's a topic which I've sort of resonated with having been involved now since I moved to Asheville, but also when I was in Philadelphia with what does that mean? Um, and I think it means something different to different people. To me, community theater, the words mean, well, it's for the, for the actors, for the most part, it's volunteerism. People are volunteering their time to be a participant in either stage craft, uh, the behind the scenes stuff, or on stage, not typically compensated. Um, and professional theater, where you get you know unions involved, and it is it is about um, doing a a, a theatrical performance with merit, but it's also about selling a lot of tickets to pay for a lot of expensive stuff that goes into professional theater. A uh, community theater um, is maybe more for, I don't like this term, but the word comes for the masses, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's for everybody. And so the, the level of intimidation um, is probably down you go to, it used to be, again, I'm old enough to, it used to be, you had to get dressed up to go to the theater. It cost a lot of money to go to the theater. Rich people went to the theater. Students went to the theater, but the mainstream people didn't, you know, get, get Broadway tickets for the most part, but community theater is different. So could you talk about the community theater concept in a way that's, that's relevant to your experience? Well, sure. Um, well, obviously, the community theater experience is one in which I, I thrive. It's something that I believe in um, because it is engaging on that broad community level. Um, and then, you know, in between that and the world of the professional theater that you described, there are just all sorts of different kinds of iterations that lean more toward the community theater, more toward the professional one thing and another. But I find that the community theater, as I said earlier, is a place where people, uh, I mean, every kind of person imaginable is needed to uh, make a community theater experience work and be worthwhile. And um, every kind of person imaginable needs to feel like their experience is valid, their time is valuable, and their work is celebrated. And it's, so it is a different kind of um, work. That said, you know, I'm, I'm also mindful too that I got to sell tickets and we got to make money. And, and that continues to be important um, even today. Uh, being at the Astral Community Theater is fascinating to me because I know that before the pandemic, the theater's uh, budget was based on an 85% earned income, which, which is to say that 85% of the budget was realized through ticket sales. That's unheard of. That's really remarkable. And my experience has been since I moved here that there's a real lot of affection 
uh, for this theater that's borne out over time and even generations. And so that's kind of thrilling. In Jacksonville, I want to I want to back up a, a good bit and tell you a story. Um, the third largest urban conflagration in the United States took place in Jacksonville on May the 1st of 1903. The city burned to the ground. Hmm. Uh, and uh, that, that's one of the reasons why Jacksonville is a kind of a nominal, an anomaly as a southern city. It doesn't look like Charleston or Savannah or even St. Augustine and New Orleans because it was built um, pretty much in 1900. And it attracted Oh gosh, um, artisans, craftspeople, architects uh, from all over the world. Among those were were people who were devotees of Frank Lloyd Wright. So um, I think Jacksonville, more than most other southern cities, has a real pronounced sort of prairie kind of vibe um, to it. But what you also saw happen was after the fire, there were um, remarkable stories that came out about you know heroism and loss and triumphant rebuilding and and all these kinds of things one of my favorite stories to come out of the fire uh, involves an old jacksonville family the Cummer family um they were very well to do and in fact there's a large uh, and very very dear museum the Cummer museum of art and gardens in jacksonville and on the side of that museum, which is on the river, uh, old Mr. Cummer, during the time of the fire, uh, took his yacht out and um, he would rescue people who had been caught up in flumes. Um, and, and in fact, this is an interesting um, point of the story with respect to the fire. The only people who died in the fire died by drowning. They gathered on the banks of the river and got sucked in. Um, and so there were seven people who died in that fire. But you can see, you know, uh, as I'm telling you this story, um, that I'm animated by it. And it is a real point of pride because it is a story of really rising from the ashes. So I would argue that in Jacksonville, this notion of storytelling um, was probably for many, many years the prevalent um, mode of artistic expression for the city. And and that was very, very attractive to me, um, learning about the city's history and, and uh, those kinds of things. So Theater Jacksonville was actually, which is a theater that I was mostly aligned with, um, uh, was founded in 1919. Um, we believed for many, many years that it was the longest running continuously producing community theater in the United States. I think there is one actually older uh, in Maine but it is among the country's most historic theaters and it has withstood challenges and time and wars and depressions and any number of other things. And what that means is that the theater is relevant. When I first heard somebody say longest running continuously producing theater, blah, blah, I thought, well, doesn't that just mean you're old? And well, no, it doesn't. Um, what it means is that you're connected and you're relevant and you're important and you're occasionally provocative and you're exciting and you're uh, a community center. And I find those same things to be true at um, Asheville Community Theater, which is, I believe cel we're celebrating our 76th uh, season of uninterrupted play production. That's, that's amazing. Um, there aren't many arts organizations in our country that can boast to being that old and again, it's not about being old. It's about doing the work of bringing people together in community to talk about things that are relevant. And that's what we've attempted to do in picking the season that lies ahead of us. And that's what we've attempted to do in engaging the people um, who are a part of uh, telling that story with us. This is a really exciting time to be engaged in this kind of work in this town right now. Well, I wanna talk about that and I can guess uh, where you can also lead us in that discussion, but I want to pause for a moment and talk about what presumably was not sort of an accidental occurrence, because you've been talking about community, you've been talking about storytelling. I know that you yourself both has been uh, both an actor and also a storyteller, and maybe one at the, one at the same time. 
but it's not, I'm guessing it's not accidental that not only are you the artistic director, you're also a director. And I'm guessing if I, unless I missed it on the schedule, the production that is in rehearsal now, Our Town is mm -hmm. your is your opening, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And Our Town is about a town and it is about community and it is about community values and community awareness and things of that nature. So uh, there's, I won't say it's irony because I don't think it's accidental, but can you talk about that? Sure, I can. Um, when I was learning about the theater and during the time uh, of the process of interviewing and becoming familiar with the theater, one of the things that impressed me, uh, most impressive thing about it is that everybody affiliated with this organization top to bottom is engaged in the uh, conversation around diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI. And that's been a very, very important focus of my work in Jacksonville. And, uh, and uh, you observed earlier that these communities are really, really different. And this is another point of real difference. In Jacksonville, the African-American population is 27% and the overall diverse population is something like 42%. In Asheville, the diverse population is 11%. And yet the leaders, the workers, the artists, the people who are aff affiliated with the organization understand that we have an opportunity to be inclusive, to tell stories in different kinds of ways. So. My first task was to uh, work on selecting the season that's coming up. And I thought, well, why don't we explore artistically the issues that uh, ACT um, finds important right now? And what are we grappling with? And what are we thinking about? And where do we want to go? And all of those things have to do with community building, living together in community, um, celebrating ourselves as a part of Asheville, but also as unique and individual and very special parts of Asheville. So it occurs to me that in telling a story um, that is at once very unique and very individual and also universal, um, it's hard to come up with a, a play um, that addresses that in a more head-on kind of way than our town. And I thought, why don't we do our town, but why don't we why don't we try to look at it the, the way we are now, and especially the way we are in Asheville right now. So the plan is not to mess with the language or the locale or anything like that, but rather to use actors as storytellers um, to convey not only the beautiful language, but the universal truths that are embedded in that play. So my thinking was, what if people um, appeared to just, you know, tumble off the street into the theater to tell this story. Um, now, now, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in inviting people to come and spend some money to look at a show that looks like a dress rehearsal. So there's a lot of design going on here. There's a, there are costumes and, and uh, insofar as the, the script allows for sets, there, there'll be those kinds of things, lots of uh, lights and those kinds of things. And the other thing that we've done that I'm really excited about is we're inviting the community to submit uh, photographs to us of their favorite places in Asheville or their favorite um, um, gathering spots or the, the pieces of architecture here that are especially beautiful or the mountains and the uh, scenic elements that draw people from all over the world to this place. And those things will be incorporated into our production of our town. I actually thought, you know, when we were putting this together that I was going to be awfully busy as the new guy in town trying to find my way. And, um, and I, I had hopes that a, a friend of mine uh, would, would direct this play instead. But she said something very interesting to me and challenged me to do it. And I thought, yeah, 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 I probably should do this play. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be doing that. And I'll put a pin in that. And we'll come back and talk about that in a little bit. But uh, what I wanted to say at this juncture is that pretty much everything that we're doing throughout the season 
explores this notion of community building. So the next show is, you know, um, the musical based on the movie that everybody loves, Elf, which is about Barry finding his way in his own special community and how he connects with people around him. The play after that is called Native Gardens. Not a lot of people know it, but for some reason, it really does resonate on a regional and theater level. Basically, it's about two couples. Uh, one is traditional, stayed, white, and they have a garden, an award-winning garden that they're very, very proud of. And then uh, next door, a new couple moves in, and they're uh, Hispanic, and he's a candidate uh, for a doctoral degree and she is pregnant and they have very, very different ideas about how a garden should live and work and grow. Um, their idea is much, much, much more organic and untamed. And uh, so from this premise, a lot of uh, hilarity, but also some provocation and some real thoughtfulness kind of evolve and emerge as these people learn about living together in their community. The next show will be Bright Star, which is about Appalachia, written by Steve Martin and Edie Brickell, based on an album that they did together, I want to say something like 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and uh, uh, that will tell a very, very interesting story. Um, it's predicated on uh, um, a suitcase that comes flying out of a train as it passes over a bridge and it's caught by someone down below and inside the suitcase, uh, there's a baby. So there are all kinds of things to explore here. And as I say, it's set in Appalachia and it really, really relies on uh, the music of the area. So I think a wonderful, wonderful opportunity uh, for musicians and actors and people of all types to work together. In fact, that show is going to benefit from a, a pretty significant partnership with the Asheville Symphony Orchestra. That's very exciting. And the last show in the season is Bat Boy the Musical, which I, it, it's a show that I just love. Basically, it's 12 actors paying 29 parts. And it's that old tabloid story uh, of uh, the, the critter that was found in a cave, half bat, half boy. And, and he's so unusual. And uh, he needs to be assimilated into the community. But with the same token, he's different. The community doesn't know how they feel about that. It's, uh, it is, it's a really terrific time. Uh, and it falls under the heading of rock musical. I think people are going to have a really good time with that. So it's a well, well-rounded uh, season. But again, the whole thing is about exploring what we as an organization are trying to figure out. How do we become better about including, celebrating, accepting, living together? Um, those kinds of things become really important. Now, going back to our town, um, another one of the things about this particular production of which I'm very proud is that the cast is just real diverse. You know, Mark, wouldn't you agree that um, I, I would argue that every kind of person imaginable has a role somewhere in that play. And, and as I look at photographs and as I look at rehearsals and as I watch you all work together night after night. I just think this is just so beautiful. And the thing of it is, um, as we hear new voices and new people tell this old story, we start to hear it in really fresh ways. I know that you were not at the uh, rehearsal last night, um, and, and I don't believe you were called to be there, but what I want to share with you is that as we were... Um, working on the cemetery scene, a number of the actors just, you know, burst into tears. It's, it's a kind of show that 90 years later still has that kind of impact um, on people. So I'm really, really, really excited to share it with uh, audiences here in Asheville. I think it's still very, very fresh and I think it's going to be made more fresh by the new and diverse and different voices that we have telling that story. I'm really excited about it. Well, I do want to speak to, to um, a couple of points you raised as well. Sure. And first of all, um, I've gone around uh, since I've been uh, rehearsing for the play, telling people I meet on the street, because I talk a lot, <laughs> engage with people I don't know. And I said, there's this production, Our Town. And I get 
two responses, different responses from different um, demographics. I get uh, people who are my age and <laughs> older and younger, but around the age say, oh yeah, I remember that. We did it in high school. It was a good play. Um, and they, they, they're, you can tell they're looking backwards as to what it was like when they were in Mrs. James's class or whatever. And they had they read this play, Thornton Wilde. Then typically with younger people, they say, our town, <laughs> I don't know anything about that play. You don't know who Thornton Wilder is, obviously. So it, there's this, this huge chasm. But what I wanted to get to was, was, and also I wanted to speak to one other point. I told you when I uh, was auditioning that our town had a special place for me with the cemetery scene. I'm not going to do a spoiler alert because I remembered it because there was a, a young woman, girl who I had a crush on who was doing the Emily monologue. And it is so affecting. But what I also wanted to say, and you spoke to this um, momentarily, is you want people, and you've chosen that wisely in terms of your casting, you want people, whether they've seen the play before, or watched it on in the movies, you know, watched other uh, productions of it, you, you want people to think of our town as being whatever town they're in. If they're local to Asheville, then Asheville is our town. And starting out, that's a bit of a challenge because our town takes place. Uh, it was, you know, produced in, in, in the early 20th century. It takes place in New Hampshire, um, largely a white community. There's some reference to some ethnic folks on the outskirts of the city. Um, and it's, it's New Hampshire. And, and that's not Asheville, even though Asheville is not as diverse, it would appear from what you've described as Jacksonville. That's not it. That's not this town. And that's not most people's town. So the emphasis, I think, is on our instead of town, our town. And that's what you're trying to bring to life in this production that's coming on at the end of uh, September. And into October. Is that sort of a correct sense of it? Yeah, I, no, I think you nailed it. And, you know, um, I know uh, when you going back to auditions, uh, among the things that happened, you know, people came in and talked to me one-on-one. -on -one, and I, I, my question was, well, what's your town? For most people, it was Asheville. For other people like you and, and others, it was someplace else. Well, what's cool about your town? What do you love about your town? What, what inspires you about your town? And we would have these quest these these conversations about our town, your town. What does what does that mean? And um, and then from there, you know, we we listened to monologues or we read sides. But then when the show was cast and I brought everybody together for the first time, um, I wanted everybody to do that same exercise together. And uh, we went around the circle and people talked about their town again. Mostly for most people, it was Asheville, but people talked about the things that moved them. And, uh, and there were some really emotional uh, moments as people talked about their love for their town and, and why they felt uh, connected or even anchored to it. It's interesting to me, too, that you would reference that monologue of Emily's toward the end of the play, where she talks about the things in her life that she is grateful for. And they're simple things like, you know, the smell of coffee or bacon on the stove or um, the light in the sky is talked about a lot. And, um, and I thought it might be interesting, too, if we talked about, for us, what are we grateful for? And uh, It's and still bacon, by the way. I just want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, terrible, but, but, uh, but um, it's very, very interesting to me because it has become a thing uh, among the cast. Once a week or so, uh, we'll start off by just going around the circle, you know, what happened today or what happened since we last were together that you're grateful for. So there's this real tone of um, emotional connection to a place um, 
a an emotional connection to gratitude um, that I think sort of informs the work and is a really safe space where these diverse people can come together and work on telling a story, which is, as you described, it's a New England story, you know, um, mostly, well, I guess at the time it would have been all white people, but it is, it is refreshing to see different people telling these words. I mean, you really, you really do hear it in a whole new way. And it makes you think about um, the things that we all share in common. Um, and again, without giving too much away for people who don't know this story, the, the first act is called The Daily Life and it, it explores daily life in our town. And basically people get up, they have breakfast, they go to school, they go to work and they come home. Um, the second act is called Love and Marriage and people fall in love and get married and have children. And um, the stage manager who is the central character in the play says uh, the third act, you can probably guess what that's about. And you and I have already talked about the cemetery scene. Just another, you know, event um, that will happen to all of us, but that all of us are connected to through the loss of people that we love, one thing and another. So everything about this play is universal. Everything about our town is universal. And to your point about, um, you know, the hour and our town, um, all of these experiences are the experiences that we all have. Um, I, think, I think we've been fairly polarized over the course of the last few years, and it's been easy to forget that we do, all of us, fall in love. We do, all of us, suffer tremendous loss. And, um, and there are big, big questions for us to consider you know, as we come upon the end of it all, which the play also takes on uh, in, in uh, really, really, really important kinds of ways. So I think it's, it, it is exactly the right play for now. I'll tell you another thing, um, uh, one, among the reactions that I get from that older crowd that you're talking about is our town, that old dusty thing, why are you doing that? And so when people say that, I say, well, what do you remember about it? Well, uh, uh, they don't remember much. Right. And really. So I understand from what you're saying, Bob, that we're talking about um, the universality of our town, even for people, you know, that have read it, but don't remember exactly what occurred. And what has struck me about our town and the, this particular line in the work with the stage manager says nobody particularly remarkable came out of our town and I thought okay but that that's probably oh, that that may be true for that town but it's probably true for everybody that lived in any community in any city including a big city so people from New York you know they can, re can relate to things that people know about like the uh, Carnegie Hall or Empire State Building in San Francisco, the Golden State Bridge. But at the end of the day, sort of a hackneyed phrase, everybody lives in a small town, even if it's part of a larger town. So I think that's part of what you were getting at, but I'd like you to continue on that. Sure, sure. Um, and, and I think that's a really good observation um, because um, I, I, I know, for example, just having lived a life in the theater, albeit the community theater. I have friends that are scattered all over the place and I have a number of friends who are active and successful in New York, but that is a very small community. And those people really do know each other and they have dinner together and they take walks in the park together and they pick up groceries for others. And, you know, I'm just, it, it, we really do live much more similarly then we do not. And I think that is one of the things that the play really brings home too, is that uh, our similarities um, really do outweigh our differences. This is one of the things that I hope people will bring away as they see, once again, these really uh, diverse and different voices telling this old story 
again about how this uh, all came together and how it works. And not to belabor the point, I think that what you're giving resonance to as well, Rob, is um, we all live in different communities. We mm-hmm. have our, our theatrical communities, our church communities, our civic communities. So community doesn't have to be defined by geographic borders. I want to, uh, and I'm remiss in this, I want to reintroduce my guest, who's Bob Arley White, Rob, Robert Arley White, Bob White, who is the artistic director for the Asheville Community Theater here in Asheville, North Carolina, the director for um, a soon to open play Our Town, uh, formerly um, a director and uh, executive for a ja- the Jacksonville Community Theater, which you'll tell me exactly what the name was. And we're talking about um, theater in general, the community yeah. surrounding the theater. And we're talking uh, also about Our Town, the production that, uh, that, that Bob is currently directing. So um, let's, let's um, unless there's you have another thought that we haven't covered on this topic of community, we could move on a little um, because I think another thing that I think you would have a unique uh, perspective of is um, theater as something that people go to see, that they, they watch, they take their time. You, you know, you still have to buy a ticket. You still have to arrange to get to the theater. You have to be there for the period of time, but not just as a result of COVID, but partially augmented by COVID. Um, people have drifted into other ways of spending their time and their money for entertainment. And we all know what those are. There's Netflix and streaming and this and that, and the, the t- hundreds of different programming opportunities. Um, but I guess you must believe, um, as those of us who are involved in arts in some way, that there's still, a, not still, but there's a very significant place for community theater, which can mm-hmm. merge with some of these other s- platforms, but it's still, it's, it has a unique responsibility and unique opportunities. So I wish you would talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I think it goes all the way back to, uh, you know, before, written uh, or recorded history you know, what what did people in community do well they sat around the fire and they told stories about their day or they imagined stories that were attached to the movement or the apparent movement of stars in the sky and and so i mean from throughout human history this need to sit together share stories has been really really important now, I think it's been an, a, a fascinating sort of a phenomenon for us to become more and more and more insular, you know, in our homes. Um, in the 30s and 40s, we gathered around the radio in our homes. In the 50s and 60s, we gathered around the television set in our homes. And then, you know, more recently, you know, we've got goggles on the earpieces so that we have this completely isolated experience with stories and creating stories and one thing and another. But even so, there is this need to venture out and sit in a dark space with other theaters. David Mamet, who's a playwright, talked about the experience of going to the movies in this way. He said that, you know, sitting in a dark room in a movie theater, I would argue the same thing is true of a theatrical, theatrical experience. I bet he would too is what we do together as a society that is sort of the same thing as when we have dreams by ourselves at night. We share dreams with other people. And this is another thing that I think is fascinating about what the play Our Town allows us to do. And I don't, I don't mean to be you know, um, pedantic in any way. I have a friend who says the use of the word pedantic is pedantic, but anyway, uh, my point is, you know, Our Town tells a very universal story but the story is made up of very individual experiences. And then I think it also calls upon, uh, I think it calls upon the audience to bring 
forth their experience as a lens or kind of filter through which everything else in the play is allowed to make sense to them, you know? So this notion that the story is universal, that it has individual aspects, but it also has aspects that allow the audience to fill in the holes with what they understand about their own lives through their own lived experiences also um, is very, very important in our town. Um, there's very, very little set. Um, it's mostly suggested a lot of the activity that takes place in the kitchens of the homes is even pantomimed. Um, there's so much opportunity for you as an audience member to hear it and to see it and, and thereby to feel it in your own way. And I think that's another thing that, uh, or I'm counting on it anyway, uh, another thing that will help to make the play successful today, because in that way, I think it really does replicate this isolated insular thing that we've all kind of become accustomed to through, you know, the screens that we look at, our individual screens with our phones or our devices, whatever they, whatever they are. But the idea that we get to do this and we go through this process in a dark room with a bunch of other people is a very, very important aspect of community building because now it's an experience that we've shared. It's my experience, but it's also our experience. And, and that whole thing, as I, as I suggested, that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We've always, always, always done this. So this need is probably you know, ingrained in us somehow. It's very important that we do this. Well, I'd like to focus on, again, another thing that you said about sort of the, the element of being together in a room. Uh, I lament frequently uh, when I'm lamenting about how many people are walking around the streets or in a, in a gym you find it a lot. And virtually uh, everybody has earphones on. And they're listening to something. And of course, when they're listening to something, they're not interacting with anybody else. They're in their head. Um, we've gone through um, the COVID experience. It's not over yet, obviously, but we've gone through uh, a shift into uh, the virtual entertainment, virtual learning, virtual school. Um, but what community theater, and, and uh, also to, need I mention, I, I've been to a movie theater a couple of times since um, the uh, COVID pandemic has sort of uh, unheated itself, so to speak. And there's not a lot of people there. Uh, it presumably obviously depends on the performance. And that was another place where people would gather and they would all laugh or all clap or all get scared out of their minds watching a horror movie. So theater, live theater, which is what it is, that's what we're talking about, live theater, everybody. <laughs> live theater is an experience that is still out there to create this community outside of the community that we're watching, for example, in, in our town. It's a community. And even though people are still, you know, they're very infatuated with their technology and with the ability to listen to exactly the curated song they want to listen to exactly at the time that they want to do that, there's still a hunger, it would appear to me, to get back together in venues, whether it's music or whether it's the theater itself, because there's something to be gained by that. And I, I again, just, I don't want to go on too long. Obviously, when people started getting, you know, transistor radios, they could listen to music and carry it around with them, and listen to whatever they wanted to, but that didn't mean they stopped going to concerts. In fact, they went to concerts in great numbers. So one does not preclude the other. And I guess there's still hope for this collective entertainment sure. concept that's represented by community theater. Uh, we yearn to be together. We're human beings and we're so animals. Um, and it, and it, that the human experience has a lot more um, validation is not the right word, but it, it certainly seems to have a lot more when it's shared. And, um, you know, I, I always think of the example of the play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, 
astonished to watch uh, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor say those things, do those things to each other on a black and white screen. But it is always not impactful to see human beings in front of you say and do those very same things, living, breathing human beings right in front of you doing those same things. It's, it always lands a harder punch um, when people are doing that. It's always a little bit sweeter when somebody is hitting that note and singing that song that you love right in front of you and, and, and not on your screen or on your TV or whatever. It's always a little bit more. And sometimes it's a whole lot more when a living, breathing human being is doing that in front of you. It's, it's, a, it's a very um, um, naked sort of a experience for the performer. I, I get into these conversations with my friends who are you know, visual artists or who are you know, songwriters or something like that. In my mind, you know, the piece is made and then it exists over there. Um, you know, you're the artist, you're not the art. Although a lot of you is in that art, I get it, but it's still, it hangs on the wall, you do not. But to be a performer in a play, that's your face. That's your body. That's you hitting the note or not. That's you um, that people are looking at and judging and um, enjoying or not. Um, but I think to be a performer is a uniquely brave thing to do. And then when you consider too, that on the community theater level, you're likely to see the fellow who delivers your paper, the, in the ancient of days, the person who brought your milk in, in, in today's uh, uh, context, you know, the, the, the person who waited on you at the restaurant last night, the, the attorney that you spoke to two days ago, the banker um, who handles your finances, see those people uh, on stage, um, people that you know who are working to inhabit a different kind of reality, to bring forward something in themselves, to share. Um, I think that just makes the whole thing even more special, unique, precious, in its best sense and lovely uh, real people doing those things for real in front of you is a, uh, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a brave sort of a miracle. It really is. Well, we've been going for a while with my wonderful guest, Bob White, Robert Arley White, the artistic director for the Asheville community theater in Asheville, North Carolina, and also the director of the upcoming play, Our Town. Uh, but we have a few minutes and I wanted to go back again in terms of something beyond the confines of the theater, which is you were obviously very involved in um, community issues, civil rights issues, advocacy. You had, a, I guess, a consulting firm, which you may still have, and you were considered, and I'm going to, to um, clean up my words, you were dubbed the kindest MF in the whole God darn city um, yeah. by someone who presumably had reason to know all that. I'm guessing that um, you're not giving that up just because you're in Asheville and that you're gonna become immersed in, in that as well as part of what you do here in, in, in this area of the world. Well, no, I think it's really, really important. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 I think it harkens back to something that I said earlier. Um, I think I'm really interested in creating community and space where everybody gets to go, where nobody gets left behind, where everybody is uh, acknowledged and seen and, and celebrated and accorded um, equal opportunity. And, uh, and, 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 and where we all live really big lives um, and, and that means a lot of different kinds of things. Um, the theater really, really earnestly takes this uh, under consideration. Every single day, we think about who is participating, 
who is not, who is helping, who could. Um, it is a real important time of opportunity. And I think you think about everything that's going on in the world right now, it's just sort of overwhelming and it feels kind of uh, ghastly in a way, but it's also loaded up with opportunity um, to, as a friend of mine says, do the right thing. Uh, I think we're called upon every day to do the right thing. And the right thing means um, taking care of other people. You know, um, somebody once asked Catherine Hepburn, and I have to say, um, I think the name Laurence Olivier came up in this conversation earlier. Maybe not, maybe I'm thinking of something else, but I was given a talk not too long ago and I used the names Laurence Olivier and uh, Catherine Hepburn and I could look at it, I could see that, oh my gosh, I don't believe this, but people don't know who I'm talking about. Isn't that amazing? But um, somebody wants Catherine Hepburn to define love and she said, it's when you put the needs and interests of somebody else ahead of your own. And, um, and that always struck with me. I thought, well, that's, that's really interesting. And I think that um, when you're doing work in the theater and when you're telling a story uh, for an audience, in a lot of ways, that's what you're doing is you're loving people because you're putting the narrative ahead of your own experience. Although your own experience informs the way you're telling that narrative. So um, I think it's uh, I always come back to the word brave, but I also think it's lovely, loving to, uh, to perform. And I, and I really, my hat is off to people who are willing to do it because it, it is a remarkable thing. It really is. Well, I want to say, um, and then we're going to probably close it up. I, I want to say my hat's off t- to you and to the Asheville Community Theater for making these things happen. And you mentioned early that, you know, this is not exactly a hugely diverse city in terms of uh, people of color and so on and so forth. But that is not, that doesn't necessarily dictate where you go with things. A quick, quick statement. I went to an Asheville tourist baseball game a couple of nights ago, as you may recall. They sang what I thought was going to be the Star Spangled Banner, but it wasn't. It was a Cherokee song, all in Cherokee no subtitles, didn't bother, you know, didn't try to put it into English. And, you know, it, it was, it was a little odd, but, you know, and, and I'm sure that most of the audience were not Cherokees or <laughs> didn't know what was being said, but they did it anyhow. So what you're doing with our town, what you're doing with the Asheville Community Theater, what the theater is doing for inclusion I think is remarkably important, particularly, as you say, in our times. And I'm going to give you the last word on that. Well, I really appreciate that. That's a, that's a very, very, very kind observation. And with respect to the um, Cherokee piece, I know that that's also important to some of the messaging that we want to have come out of our theater. Uh, a lot of people over a mighty long time have sort of brought us all to this point. We talk about this in our town too, and talk about it very, very specifically. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to share that story. I'm really grateful for the opportunity that you've extended to me and also to the theater to to share what we're doing, a little bit about what we're about right now. It's been a lot of fun talking with you. And uh, so thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Bob White, for being on the show today. Um, Go see our town. (laughs) Do it. Take care.